On the last side, I introduced you to Knapsack Voting, uh, which is sort of a tweak on K approval voting. So remember, K approval voting, uh, that's where voters vote for up to K public projects, thumbs up or thumbs down. And this constraint of K thumbs up is independent of what the project's costs. And the issue with K approval voting is that uh, costly projects tend to be overrepresented in the results because voters aren't forced to take into account project costs uh, when they're making their votes. Whereas knapsack voting, the constraint is different. You're allowed to vote for any number of public projects, but the constraint is that the sum of those project costs should be at most the budget. So really as a voter in knapsack voting, you're put in the same shoes of the actual decision makers who have to respect uh, that budget constraint. So there's some nice intuition about why knapsack voting might be a good idea, and in particular, uh, better than uh, K approval voting. But so to what extent can we actually you know, tell a mathematical story that supports that point? Can we have sort of theory that suggests, yes, you know, in fact, uh, as intuition would suggest, knapsack voting is a good idea. It's going to have some nice properties. Now, participatory budgeting, it's not that simple a problem. It's definitely more complicated than, say, just a single item auction. And so accordingly, the guarantees we're going to be able to prove for knapsack voting are not going to be as sweeping, as sort of, you know, uncontroversial, ex uncontroversially excellent as our guarantees for the Vickery auction and its truthfulness guarantee. Instead, what we'll be able to prove is what we'll impose some fairly strong assumptions on voter preferences, not crazy, but fairly strong assumptions on voter preferences. And under those assumptions, we'll be able to show uh, that knapsack voting is indeed guaranteed to have some nice properties like truthfulness uh, and Pareto optimality. Now, you know, maybe when I say this, you, you wonder, you know, well, does such work have any value, right? If you make strong assumptions, strong enough that they're probably not 100% true in the real world, you might say, who cares what conclusions you derive from these, you know, not 100% correct assumptions? Um, you know, but the reality is, you know, when you're solving real world problems like participatory budgeting, um, you know, it's, you know, if you're going to, if you're going to propose some system, it's better to have some narrative about why it works well than the alternative of having no narrative of why it works well. Uh, and so, you know, basically um, in looking at a special case, you know, which maybe doesn't cover the general case you have to, you have to meet in reality, but the special case can at least give you a plausibility argument that the solution you're proposing, like knapsack voting, a uh, plausibility argument that it is in fact a good idea. So the hope then would be that the guarantees we're going to show will continue to hold, uh, at least approximately, if you relaxed our assumptions about what bidders want. Now, that's just a hypothesis. That's something you have to go out and test in the field. Um, but at least it lets you generate the hypothesis that knapsack voting is going to do pretty well pretty frequently. Then, of course, you deploy it. Hopefully, it does well. If it doesn't do well, you go back and you revise the theory to get a more accurate explanation uh, about how good or bad knapsack voting is. Okay, so that's kind of the, the broader context of this type of work. We're going to look at a special case where we really can say something quite strong about knapsack voting. That at least suggests that uh, knapsack voting might have more or less those properties much more generally. So the first property we're going to prove is a truthfulness property, saying that bidders uh, are motivated to bid truthfully uh, or vote truthfully. So we have to say, you know, first of all, what does it even mean to vote truthfully? We have to define that. Um, and secondly, right, to say that, you know, a bidder is incentivized to do that, like say they have a dominant strategy to vote truthfully, whatever that means, that implies some kind of utility model. So we actually have to write down our assumption about what it is bidders want. So what function is it that they're going to vote strategically to optimize? So let's do that now. Assumptions about uh, voter utility. So assumption number one, we're going to think about each voter I as being focused on trying to get a certain subset of the projects uh, funded. So we're going to call that subset capital S sub I. So for example, you know, maybe it's bidder number 17. And bidder number 17 really wants the projects three, five, and six. And moreover, we're going to, you know, constrain the bidder so that you know, the projects that it wants to fund, they should, it should be feasible to fund them all. So the overall costs of projects three, five, and six should be at most the cost of the budget. So you can sort of think of this as, as, as if we, you know, we asked voter I, if you were a dictator and you got to unilaterally decide which uh, pro projects we would spend the budget on, what would you pick? And then S I, S star I is going to be the answer that the voter gives us. The second assumption, which is where it's going to get a little bit unrealistic, is we're going to assume that uh, voter I is single-mindedly concerned 
uh, about getting funds um, granted to the public projects that it cares about, to the projects in uh, S star I. And so that's really sort of two assumptions. So the first assumption, which is still not great, but a little less bothersome, um, is that voter I doesn't care amongst the projects in S star I, the voter is indifferent to where the funds go. Okay, so just any funds to any projects in S star I, we're gonna assume the voter is happy with it. Uh, even, you know, and then the most bothersome assumption is gonna be for projects outside of S star I, we're going to assume that the voter has value zero for funding being devoted to that, right? And that's, you know, strictly speaking, it's probably not true. Like, even if you really care about the schools, um, it's not that you get zero value if funding instead goes to sort of, you know, renovating the streets. Um, but again, that's going to be the assumptions under which the good news is, in exchange for these assumptions, we'll be able to prove some pretty strong guarantees for knapsack voting. And again, to, to interpret this, it's not that we literally believe these assumptions are true in the real world. It's that we're crossing our fingers and hoping that the conclusions we can draw under these assumptions remain valid more robustly, remain valid uh, even in real world settings. Of course, that's something that has to be tested empirically by actually deploying it and seeing what happens and seeing if you're happy with the results. So what are these nice properties that I've been promising? Uh, well, the first property is going to be truthfulness. So truth, a truthfulness guarantee in the same sense that we had it for the Vickery auction. Uh, so what does truthful voting mean in this context? Uh, well, you know, given our assumptions, there's a natural notion of truthful voting, which is just that uh, voter I votes for the projects in its favorite set S star I. It doesn't withhold any votes for any of the projects that it likes, and it doesn't give any votes to the projects that it doesn't like. So that's quite nice. Truthful voting is a dominant strategy. Um, it's not so hard to formally argue this property, but I'll just give you the intuition. Uh, so basically, you know, if you think about, you know, what are the consequences if a voter moves its votes from projects it cares about in S star I to other projects, pretty much the only thing that that can result in, if you look at how the knapsack voting works, if, the, if you look at the way that it allocates funds from most popular to least popular, by moving votes to the projects you don't care about, that just makes those projects more popular, okay, it has more votes, which move them upward in the ordering in which knapsack voting will consider it. So in other words, diverting your own votes from your projects in S star I to the other projects uh, has the consequence of diverting funding from the projects you care about to the projects you don't care about. That is, it has the consequence of only decreasing your utility, decreasing the total funding on the projects uh, that you care about. So that's why you have this strong truthfulness property. Okay, so for every voter, as long as it meets these first two assumptions, uh, it's a dominant strategy to vote for a project if and only if it's one of the ones you want, one of the projects in S star I. So that's the first property, a truthfulness guarantee, sort of analogous to what we had for the Vickery auction. Uh, now, remember, when we were talking about K approval voting, we observed that, you know, uh, plausibly, uh, the voters would vote in a way that leads to an uh, outcome which is not Pareto optimal, an outcome where there's some other outcome where everybody would be better off. Remember, that was the example where everybody voted uh, for the expensive project, which generated a value of four per voter, but it would have been better to fund the two less expensive projects, which would have generated a value of five per voter. And so the second property says that that's not going to happen with knapsack voting. This again is under the assumptions, you know, one and two about this sort of uh, bidder utility model. And then also it's under the assumptions that uh, bidders bid truthfully, so that they really do vote uh, for their set S star I. But property one says they are encouraged. There is a reason why you might hope that they would uh, be voting, voting truthfully, voting for their best set, because that's a dominant strategy. If everybody does that dominant strategy, uh, then in fact, you do wind up with a Pareto optimal outcome. So in that sense, knapsack voting uh, is strictly better than the simpler, uh, more naive K-approval mechanism. Just to remind you what it means to be Pareto optimal, uh, that means that the only way you can make someone better off is to make somebody worse off. So in this context, uh, in the context of this participatory budgeting uh, with our bitter utility model, Pareto optimal means the only way you can make someone happier, meaning have more funds devoted to their projects, is to make someone else less happy. That is divert funds away from their projects.
Here again, it's not so hard to argue formally, but I'll just I'll give you the intuition. Um, this really is because knapsack voting, the way it processes the projects from most popular to least popular. Uh, so to give more funding you know, to any project, to you know, somebody's project that they care about, to make them better off, that has to be diverting funding from a more popular project to a less popular project. And that means there's going to be somebody that's worse off when you divert funds uh, in that way. So that's why you get the Pareto optimality condition as well. That concludes what I wanted to tell you about, about connections between voting and computer science, uh, and specifically this application of participatory budgeting. Uh, unlike several of the previous modules, you know, which was sort of well understood already in the 20th century, um, I hope you know, a sense you get from this fifth module um, is that these connections between computer science and economics and sort of real world applications, is very much a living, breathing field. There's really sort of exciting stuff happening uh, as we speak. So there's been some really nice progress just in the last few years on better mechanisms, better, better voting schemes for participatory budgeting, but also there's still clearly a lot that we do not understand. A lot of exciting work uh, remains to be done. So for next uh, module, that'll be our last one. Uh, and speaking of sort of cutting edge stuff, which uh, we only partially understand and where there's a lot of exciting opportunities uh, for future scientific work, uh, the last module will be about Bitcoin, the world's most famous cryptocurrency uh, and most famous blockchain. I'll see you there.